All right, everyone. Well, welcome. Thanks for the intro, Jenny. Um, as she mentioned, this is Marketing to Modern Consumers, and it's an overview of branding basics uh, for consumer loyalty. Um, again, my name is Vanessa Chang, founder and director of EAT Consulting, or EAT Consulting, and happy to do this presentation for Dairy Australia today, um, and happy to do it on short notice, because uh, marketing really is uh, my passion. Um, and I over the course of my career in the past 10 years or so, I've really um, figured out that uh, it, it's more, I think, endemic to our daily lives than just say our professional lives or our, our, our business lives and our business identities. And we'll get into why that is. Um, as Jenny mentioned, just a little bit about me. Um, I've had about a decade of experience, primarily in the specialty in natural food marketing. And what's interesting about that is that coming from that space, when I started, it was a very much a niche area. But now because of the way um, consumers are paying attention to their food and the decisions that they're making about how they're going to use their, um, their dollars uh, at, at the store or at a farmer's market or at a restaurant, um, specialty in natural food has really come to the fore um, in Western markets. And actually you're seeing that uh, trend quite a bit, even in Eastern markets, wherever there's an affluent middle class, where there is sort of this excess of choice and excess of lifestyle, um, people really do want something more than just a functional product. And suddenly a lot of brands or categories, whether it be cheese or in my case, charcuterie, um, and also in the natural sphere, were once sort of on the fringe are really capturing a lot of that market share, or in other words, business um, and attention from these consumers. So it's kind of coming to the center. And what you're finding is that a lot of the established bigger companies can't really compete because they're almost too big and not responsive and adaptive enough. And that's been kind of to our advantage as smaller producers and as artisans. Um, throughout my um, my career though, I've definitely spent time kind of still honoring my roots. And uh, I sat for the certified cheese professional exam, which essentially is, I think the American Cheese Society equivalent of becoming um, like a, a, a level one or two master sommelier. Um, and I live and breathe sort of good food. Um, food is my primary hobby. Um, I, I speak on it quite a bit. Um, I teach several classes here at the Cheese School of San Francisco uh, for distributors, the um, IDF, the Institute de Fromage for Gourmet Foods International. And I've done quite a bit of um, writing on the subject as a consumer and as someone um, in the business. My background's primarily been in cheese. My soul is in cheese. Um, however, I also have a lot of background in charcuterie very much a related category and have personally kept uh, a, a keen interest in the fine chocolate world and uh, very happy to also be talking to everyone in Australia today because Australia is actually the home to a couple of uh, very fine chocolate producers coming out to the fore. So Jenny's right um, in terms of beverage, wine, cheese, and certainly chocolate and coffee, um, Australia very much has uh, a lot to offer their consumers. Um, when people think of marketing, they think of typically like advertising and PR, um, but my specialty is actually brand and product development um, and innovation. And when people see that word innovation, I think they cringe a little bit. I certainly did um, because artisan food production is supposed to be about um, honoring traditions and this preservation of, you know, a, a way of producing a food product or the way of stewarding the land. Um, but what I found is that um, we've actually innovated through tradition um, in the Western markets of reintroducing modern consumers to good food that is made with integrity, that is made with clean ingredients. And so um, it's a different turn on innovation and in that innovation has actually been our strength as small businesses and that um, it's something that we need to embrace, um, not just in what we make, but also how we do business and how we talk to people about who we are. And so that kind of uh, goes into this next slide here, which is essentially what is marketing? And uh, if you ask marketers that question, uh, that, that you're gonna get several different answers because you're gonna find there are several facets of marketing. And as I mentioned before, um, there's quite a bit of emphasis on sort of this, you know, flashy sort of like PR agent or like, you know, these advertising executives, the sort of mad men sort of universe. Um, and it seems very manipulative and, and, and very insincere, but uh, it, 
it, you can also actually look at it from a very business point of view um, in terms of really knowing what your landscape is, like where it is that you're operating, who you are and who you're talking to. And really in the grand scheme of things, it, it's just a way to kind of help you decode yourselves and what's going on around you. And so I like to pull these two um, uh, definitions in particular when I like to explain to people, even fellow marketers, what is marketing? And that is the action or business of promoting and selling products or services, um, including market research and advertising. So it ranges from data analysis and, uh, you know, understanding like movement and velocity reports from your, from your distributors or from if you're selling to a larger retailer or if you're even a large enough business and you actually pull sort of um, sales data from a bigger entity like the Nielsen reports. Um, you may hear of Nielsen and media, like Nielsen ratings for TV or for, or for movies. Um, but Nielsen also um, actually pulls feedback and data on how people spend their money. Um, and that usually applies to really big, uh, what are called CPGs. And CPG stands for consumer packaged goods. And actually the world of cheese very much falls into this world of CPG. Um, and the reality is, is that those tools are very helpful in terms of assessing what's out there but it's not necessary. So a lot of people feel like, oh, data analysis, market analysis, market research, how am I supposed to do that? There are actually very effective ways to do it without a huge budget and actually have more efficacy um, for smaller artisans and producers, particularly you have less layers to kind of go through to really figure out what it is that your consumers want. And of course, advertising. And advertising may seem kind of false. You know, there's a lot of, I think the key word here with advertising particularly is maybe this idea of manipulation. But uh, really, for artisan producers and, and, and specialty food producers, the advertising is more about keying into what resonates, resonates being the key word. The second definition I like is also a management process through which goods and services move from concept to consumer. Basically, um, how you work to bring your dream, your vision, what you find to be, what you think is a solution that people need into life and how people actually experience it out there in the real world. Um, and in, uh, when you go for a master's of business administration, or if you take sort of a marketing 101 class, the, the four fundamentals that you learn that really any business owner, entrepreneur, um, whether it's food or software or, you know, a, a small mom and pop auto mechanic, what you really do need to understand about what it is that you do um, are these four P's. And that's product, what you're going to make, what you're going to offer the world, what you think the world needs in terms of a solution. And in terms of food, there are a lot of good solutions that we still need out there, including in cheese. Um, second is price. Um, how do you rate in pricing compared to maybe what the Australian market grew up with, you know, in the past generation or two versus what they're used to now versus what they're interested in spending and what's everybody else spending in comparison and, you know, how does that impact how people see you as a producer, as an artisan or as a brand? And also place, where are they going to find you? Where are they going to find you um, to buy? Where are they going to find you when people talk about the food scene um, or you know, di different associated movements, whether you are all about sustainability, about land stewardship, um, all, any other uh, philosophy or value that pertains to you. And then finally, promotion. Uh, promotion in the sense of you know, how do we get buyers and people in the trade to actually help you get that product front and center with the people who need to be paying attention to it. And also how you and everybody associated with you will be talking about the product to the world at large. And there seems to be a lot of overlap um, between sales and marketing and often in specialty, uh, we find that sales and marketing are often combined, um, usually because of resources. You know, you don't have, maybe you don't have the resources to staff uh, a completely separate sales team or a completely separate marketing team, or you have one sales and marketing person. And that's kind of the structure that a lot of people do. But in terms of pure sort of functional terms, um, they really work hand in hand, whether you have two different people, two different departments, or one person, or um, a couple of people handling it all. But to kind of help you parse it out, sales is everything that you can do to make your brand and product physically available. So if someone is, you know, 
hears good word of mouth about your cheese or about your fresh cheese curds or about what you do at the farmer's market, that they'll be able to find you at that farmer's market or, or um, on the shelf of their local specialty food store or anywhere else. So that's this idea of distribution. Where can they physically find your product? Also, sales has a lot to do um, after sort of that market research marketing phase in terms of setting the pricing, like with the buyer, how can we promote this? Um, it, it dovetails with number three in terms of how can we make it more enticing to the consumers to, to drive what's called trial. We want the product in their mouths in the case of specialty food. And also which channels, which stores do you want to be in? Which farmer's markets do you want to be in? Do you even want to kind of control everything yourselves and you can handle shipping very well and it's the right time of year, like it's the holiday. Do you want to do a direct to consumer uh, e-commerce channel? Is that something you want to take on as well because you have more control or you have the resources? Those are all the things that um, sales can help determine. Marketing kind of works even uh, farther before that. It sets up all the infrastructure. And the point of that is to make the brand and the product mentally and emotionally available. Mentally in terms of people will see your label or maybe your logo or your sticker. You know, who can, you know, not really understand like the Nike swoosh logo if you just see the swoosh or you see the bitten apple icon. These are sort of legendary and iconic. And you know, maybe a specialty pro cheese producer won't ever quite, quite get to that status, but you know, uh, someone can at least see the difference between a premium uh, style of cheese, a more artisan style of cheese by their label and their packaging than they would say something that's a little bit more commodity um, or something that's a little bit more of a legacy brand from a larger producer or a larger company. And so it all has to do with that B word, brand. And so you have to develop your brand and it's also innovating your brand, um, kind of helping it to stand out from all the noise that's out there. And that's what informs sales in terms of channels, promo and pricing. Now, once that's all developed and sales is kind of out there doing its thing, marketing also looks over say like PR, um, public or press relations. Um, it's also the where you're gonna find sort of like digital web and SEO teams um, as well as social media. And it's obviously sort of all that creative stuff, the logo, your, your packaging, the stickers that you like to use, even the paper that you like to wrap the cheese in, or, you know, if you use, if you're into ultra fresh dairy and you have milk, you know, what sort of bottle and, and caps do you use? Can you use something to kind of make something uniquely you? And obviously there's advertising, which is different than PR, um, which is, you know, buying airtime at a radio station, um, buying space on a signboard, you know, um, at the farmer's market or, you know, working out something with a local restaurant to make sure that your cheese is branded with your creamery's name um, on the menu to kind of get it more mentally available. So they go, oh yes, I had this amazing fresh chef um, at this gastropub down the street and I really liked it. And I see that it's the same chef that, you know, I've, that at the grocery market that I shop at, you know, every week. And so just kind of making it more familiar. And of course, marketing is a home of market research, whether it's big data, um, or in the case of artisans, uh, direct consumer, finding out directly from your biggest fans what it is that they like and that they don't like about your product. And you can do that either through farmer's markets or email questionnaires. And we can delve a little bit um, into that a little bit more deeply um, on slide 12. And so really the biggest thing that you need to address when you figure out how do I resonate with consumers more? What makes me relevant? How do I stand out? And it all has to do with you. And you in this case is under the keyword brand, brand with a capital B. And it essentially communicates who you are, what you stand for. Um, it represents the relationship between you and your audience, your target audience, the people who naturally gravitate towards you at the wine bar or at the farmer's market or at the cheese counter. Um, and it's also a result of everything that you do. You know, maybe you make the cheese because you love the land where you grew up, or maybe you make the cheese because you want to preserve a certain type of animal that you think is more sustainable or provides a better overall quality of product um, to make cheese or to make other dairy products. And what you have to remember about brand, brand is not a logo, like a logo does not make a brand. A brand goes beyond the visuals and it even goes beyond your products and your product attributes. Your brand cannot be creamy, melty goodness. Like that's not a brand, that's a product attribute. 
what, what you want your brand to be goes beyond those physical characteristics. It, it really encapsulates who you are and what you find um, with a lot of artists and producers and what I love and I think is the key to their success is that the brand is authentic because it's often driven by a person or um, a couple of people who saw a need for something, whether it was better food, um, a certain style of cheese because they had, you know, from a family memory or from a recent trip. Um, there is a direct um, drive and instance from the idea of inspiration and conception to the actual creation of the project. And what we're finding in modern day consumers, they don't trust companies. What they trust are stories and people and feeling like they have a relationship with it. They don't necessarily, you know, want to buy a cheese because, you know, it's the best one that melts. They're going to buy a cheese and spend a little bit more um, on something that resonates with them in terms of values, who they are. I mean, think about it. Why do you buy the type of clothes that you buy or the colors that you gravitate to or style of clothing that you gravitate to? Why do you buy certain brands of coffee or certain types of coffee or certain flavors of beverages? Why do you, how do you buy, you know, for instance, a bottle of wine when you walk, you know, when you walk down the beverages aisle? It, it's all informed about our own identity and what you're really trying to find are the people who kind of have the same values as you and you have the advantage as artisans and a specialty food producers um, in being very transparent and being very authentic because you came into this business for a reason and usually that reason is compelling enough to get people to pay attention to who you are and what it is that you do that's the first step the next step is you're on the scene you're with other passionate people and other passionate producers then how do you stand out? And so this is where the visual components really comes in, but the brand is really gonna be like your North Star or your guiding light. This is gonna be your compass due north. So any business, small or large, can and should have a brand. Now, when I first started in marketing, um, total disclaimer, I'm a bit of a rebel. So when someone tells me I have to do something, I automatically don't wanna do it um, in the first go. <coughs> Excuse me, and so when people said, um, especially as I started my career, oh, Vanessa, what's your personal brand? Um, I found it kind of offensive. It was like, what do you mean, you know, personal brand? That sounds so um, superficial or materialistic. I'm not a brand, I'm a person. Um, but what I realized was brand is just shorthand for your own sort of personal manifesto and your credo <laughs> and how you see the world and how you make decisions. And for me, that really came to light as I became more mature sort of as, as a food consumer, not just as a marketer, because I consciously chose in, in my own personal life to buy certain brands that aligned with things that I strove for, um, either in terms of sustainability, um, in terms of food quality, in terms of design aesthetic. You know, when I open the fridge, I want, I love seeing, you know, labels with designs that look great for me and also come from pasture raised dairy or come from grass fed meats. Um, and so it really came to, to, this re to this realization that brand is not a bad word and it's not superficial at all. It just, becomes your shorthand for how you can effectively do business and stand out. So on the left here, you're going to see a, a trio of cheese logos, and you may know all of them, in fact. Um, first is Cypress Grove Chev, and Cypress Grove has a very distinctive uh, packaging element. Of course, you know, they're, they're known for a distinctive style of cheese in terms of their fresh goat cheese with a few uh, aged varieties thrown in. But what you'll notice is, is that their packaging is fairly consistent in that it still looks very rustic. Um, there's nothing super, super um, industrial looking about it, but there's always that logo on there in terms of the big cypress with the silhouette of the goats, and it's encapsulated in that in that very striking purple um, circle. And within that, then you get sort of that really fun Northern California quirkiness. And in their area of Arcata, Humboldt County, California, it's always been um, an epicenter for, not the riffraff, but epicenter for kind of like the hippies and the people you know, who thrive in the age of Aquarius. And you know, they were into medicinal marijuana way before anybody else was. And so you know, there's an allusion to Purple Haze, one of their best-selling cheeses. Um, but it shows off their personality. So it's unmistakable who it is. It's Cypress Grove. Chances are it's going to be a goat cheese. And then inside, it kind of gives a nod to their quirkiness 
um, and, and sort of the area of Humboldt County in terms of um, their, their, their funkiness, their, their affinity for rock and roll and Grateful Dead um, and other sort of recreational activities. Now to the right of that, you have another pioneer in the American artisan cheese world, Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company, um, the Giacomini family, and now the latest ge uh, generation of Giacomini sisters. And what you find is something very much different. They, they too kind of came into the cheese scene at about the same time that Mary Keene did, maybe um, actually maybe about a decade after, but they're part of that same sphere they're found in the same, um, the same cheese shelves um, the, and, and the, they often have kind of overlapping audiences on social media. But what you find is they have a much more low key um, approach to their logo, their packaging and their, and their brand. And the reason is, is that they're more traditional. They have the heritage card to play in that, you know, this is a generations old family dairy and they want it to survive. So they're turning this wonderful West Marin County milk into this wonderful cheese. And so they don't want to go full quirky and fully out there, but what they want to do is say, we're modern, um, we're the latest generation of this farming family, but we're also showing that uh, we haven't lost our roots and that it's very much um, associated with this dairy land. And very monochromatic, very sophisticated, very Martha Stewart friendly um, uh, visually. And so you have two modern brands that, that, that give you different sort of feelings and different sort of approaches. Below that, you have what's called kind of like a legacy brand um, or a, a traditional brand, um, more of a, a larger cheese manufacturer, sort of that block cheddar. And they have more of a standard sort of um, market look, sort of retail supermarket look um, in, in that it, it calls out to this idea of tradition and legacy, but a lot less stylized. Um, and it, for a lot of people, it, it's pretty nostalgic. And, you know, they would kind of couple this in, in the realm of, let's say, like the Kraft cheeses or like a Sargento cheese. But you'll find that your personality and not just like, quote unquote, your company personality, but your own personality as the founder, as the artisan can and should come up um, at every point where your customers and your consumers can find you. In the middle there, um, of course, who can forget, who can not know Starbucks, they're everywhere. Um, I, even uh, actually in Asia and the Pacific, uh, they have the highest concentration of Starbucks in the world now. Um, and they're everywhere, they're ubiquitous. Uh, people know that you're gonna go there, you can get a caramel macchiato, um, you, you expect a certain level of service, you, you expect sort of a certain uh, level of product mix. But then you have, especially in Australia, this whole movement, I think it's fourth wave coffee, where um, people took a different approach to their coffee. It was less commodity, it was less about the flavors and the syrups and sort of like these concoctions. It was more about the origin of the bean, the terroir of the bean. The coffee suddenly had as much importance and as much, um, as much of a story um, as say a fine wine. And actually, I, I, it's wonderful because Australia really was sort of the epicenter of that before it made its way to the west coast of, of Los Angeles. So, you know, I have places like Duke's, you know, Roasters in Melbourne to thank for, you know, really good coffee, you know, that I can find like at, you know, Intelligentsia or Four Barrel or Sight Glass um, here in the Bay Area. But you can see the difference there. Um, no words, but they both signal coffee, but very different types of coffee experiences. So when you walk in through the door, you know that you're gonna get something different. Um, and likewise, you're gonna find this in uh, specialty chocolate. We have in the lower right-hand corner, Ghirardelli chocolate, intense dark, very um, similar packaging to say Lint, the Swiss brand, L-I-N-D as in Donald, T as in Thomas. Um, Ghirardelli chocolate, um, kind of a traditional packaging, super dark, they emphasize the percentage. And then you compare that to um, a, a craft chocolate producer, dandelion chocolate here in the Bay Area, and a lot more text, a lot more story. The label, if you see, is laid out like a wine label to kind of tell the consumer not only where the beans came from, but what flavor notes to expect. Um, who actually roasted the beans, who made the barn, who inspected it, and the best by date. And it all coincides with this beautiful, you know, textured packaging um, from a Japanese paper artisan that they decided is just what they do. And so every single bar has this unique paper um, um, wrapped, wrapping each bar. And so you can be a business and you can make something that any that somebody else may already be making a lot of other people may already be making but you can do it differently stick out in a good way 
and actually thrive. Dandelion is actually opening up their new um, manufacturing facility in San Francisco. They're still considered one of the premier um, world's uh, chocolate producers, and they're opening up cafes um, in Tokyo and Seoul, South Korea. So what does it take to build a brand? And so these are kind of the key elements that you need. Um, the first is your story, um, the narrative. And if you are like um, a lot of the food producers I know, you just wanna do your job. You just wanna make cheese. You wanna hang out with your animals. Um, you you wanna make good food that other people wanna eat. But the catch is, is that if you want your business to succeed and you wanna do this in the long run, people kinda have to know who you are. And, and, and a lot of that is gonna have to be you kind of coming up front and center, if not physically, then digitally, um, or on Instagram or at trade shows, for you to tell or document somehow your superhero origin story, all right? Why are you on this path, right? And that's the beautiful thing about food, and I think why a lot of consumers are drawn to it, is it's something inspirational, um, in terms of, say, you know, someone who used to be climbing the corporate ladder and they decided, I don't want to do this anymore. My heart is in whiskey distilling. My heart is in making cheese. My heart is in being a rancher and looking after a certain breed of steer that I want to turn um, into the most amazing meat. And so people need to know that. They want to know your superhero origin story. They want to know that you are a person. Um, Part of that narrative too is actually also how you tell the story. What words do you use? How do you talk? What's that tone and that personality? Because the way Point Reyes talks about their cheese is not gonna be the same way Cypress Grove talks about their cheese. Um, and, and all of that encapsulates what you represent. And a great example of that is what you see at the bottom left, and I think who was a recent guest here on Dairy Australia, is Mary Quick. Her superhero origin story is immense. You know, 15, 14 generations of uh, farming family uh, now manifested in terms of this extraordinary cheese making operation that balances not only being a sustainable business, but also being a sustainable um, uh, producer of cheese, also being a sustainer, uh, excuse me, a sustainable member of the community and still preserving this land um, and really representing sort of this, this English countryside um, that really a lot of these open spaces very much are disappearing, not just in England, but all over the world. So that kind of galvanizes people, whether it's trade or consumer, to really believe in the product and that, you know, the product is there for a reason. And so you see the sub point here in terms of your narrative is going to essentially craft these three, you could have call them documents or, or sources, but your narrative is going to be your mission, which is your why. Why are you doing what you do? Secondly, your purpose. So you figured out why you want, why you're here and why you're doing this thing. So the purpose is essentially, so what are you gonna do about it, right? Are you gonna make the most phenomenal sheep's milk cheese ever to be available in Australia? Um, are you going to make, um, are you going to make the most you know, decadent yogurts or creme fraiches because there hasn't been anything like it yet in Australia and you found like an incredible breed of cow? And also your positioning. Where are your people? Where are they gonna find you? Where are you gonna put yourself in front of the people that are really gonna jive? with your story and what you have to offer. Mary Quick's story is extraordinary, but it's harder to convey in a larger conventional chain market setting. Um, in America, we have a, a huge chain called Kroger, has about 800 outlets across the country, coast to coast. And they recently acquired Murray's Cheese in New York City. And they put in these cheese kiosks, which is fantastic because it ups sort of the, the, the entry level of cheese exposure to most American consumers. However, for brands like Mary, it's hard to translate that quick cheese experience into that conventional marketplace. And so you find them then, Quicks, much better suited and actually doing a lot better numbers um, in, in the smaller specialty cheese stop shops, the, the natural stores that have more robust cheese programs. They're purposeful in their positioning in terms of who they talk to and where their product is going to be physically available and emotionally, mentally available. Secondly, the key element, your voice, all right? your tone, your personality, the words you use. The way Mary Quick talks about her land um, and the way she talks about her cheese is the same way that Tom Chatfield, um, her right-hand man, will be talking about the, the products. Is the same way Jesse, their marketing head, will be talking about their products, the same way their cheesemakers, 
their farmers, their dairymen will be talking about it. And as you grow, not just from farmer's market footprint, but even beyond, say, into distribution, um, your distributors, the people who represent you at the retailers or at the restaurants, they'll need to be able to you know, say the same things, speak of them in the same way, in the same style. Um, your tone, personality, and the words you use very, very much matter. Um, and that feeds directly into the third point, which is your symbols. Not just your logos, but what colors are you known for? You know, the font, the textures, and the shapes. And a great um, example of that are two local dairies to me here in the Bay Area of California. Up top, you have another champion of American artisan cheese scenes. In fact, one of the originals, uh, Cowgirl Creamery by uh, Peggy and Sue. And here you have, you know, you may not know that, you know, all the details of this logo, but by gosh, if you see that sort of like westerny, old timey kind of font and that bucking, you know, horse, you know, with the lady on its back, you know that that is cowgirl creamery and that you're going to expect sort of a, a certain style of cheese. Or if I were new to cheese, I'd be like, that is something very unique that you would never uh, confused with something like Point Reyes or Cypress Grove. It's distinctive, but it also lends to, you know, a, a, a certain tone and personality in that they're kitschy. They're very much casual. Um, they're very much tied to the land and the history um, of West Marin and Sonoma County. Likewise, below that, you have another Sonoma-based dairy called Clover Organic. Wonderful operation. They do a lot of ultra-fresh dairy. Um, but their approach to it is a little bit more cheeky. You know, this cow that you see sort of lounging next to this carton of milk is something that they use across all of their channels. So this is what you see on their cartons. This is what you see on their coupons. This is what you see at um, the farmer's market where they have a farmer's market stand and their banners. It's on their buttons. It's on their website. It's on the roadside billboards. So this cow and the sort of corny sense, uh, sense of humor and tone is very much associated uh, with Clover, and you'd never confuse that with Calgo Creamery and vice versa. So once you have all of that dialed in, what's next is making sure that it's consistent um, with the people who help you sort of sell the product, you know, whether it's the gal or a guy that you hire to help you out at the farmer's market, the person answering your phone, the person that helps you answer the email or respond to social media comments, to the people actually selling your product. Uh, and if you hire somebody else new, that you guys are on the same page and that you talk about it in the same way. Um, and that goes for even how you represent yourself on your website, and especially nowadays on your social social media channel, um, making sure that it, it may sound redundant to you if you're the one kind of plotting all of this onto the charts, but in reality, um, it, it's just the most effective way to make sure that you stay consistent um, to who you are and what you're trying to offer the world. And it's through those digital channels that um, you get the highest sort of return in terms of engagement and interaction. And that's the only way brands really build and actually thrive in that you get people emotionally involved with who you are and what you're doing, that they believe in your cause because essentially your cause is their cause. Um, when anybody ever purchases anything by and large, whether it's their favorite beer, um, their favorite brand of shoes, they buy it because it's not, a, it's not that necessarily the company that they're buying into, they're buying into themselves. So, you know, if I'm into craft beer, it says it because I value certain, you know, style or, or quality of food. So for me, I'm really just affirming my own identity and my own personality. And so why bother doing all of this? I mean, it's busy enough just doing cheese production and dairy production and taking care of your animals or just getting things to market. Why do I need to bother doing any of this marketing stuff? And there are three key reasons, um, especially as um, an artisan food producer. Number one is differentiation. And you see these lovely Holstein ladies out on this very, very green meadow. And one of them is very different. Uh, that's my purple cow. You want to be like this gal. Um, you're like, why? Why would I want to stick out and look really weird like that? Um, and this alludes to um, a very, very good book. Um, that if you can find, I highly suggest you read as a business owner. It's not just for marketers. I think it's just a good life lesson. And it is literally called The Purple Cow. And the author is Seth Godin. And I can share it with you uh, during the Q&A session as well. But the book really underlines the importance of being unique and different. And not just because you're quirky or you're weird, 
but as a matter of survival. So you've probably noticed in the past five to seven years, there are a lot more cheese producers or that the bigger companies are trying to look more artisan and look more specialty and maybe sharing the same cheese case, same space in the cheese case as you guys. And so this is where differentiation really comes into play, that you need to somehow stand out and be distinctive in that noise. It doesn't mean being the loudest. It doesn't mean being obnoxious. It doesn't mean being sort of sensational in any way. What it means is, is that you offer something unique and that you make that obvious and available um, to the buyers who can help you put you know, your product out there and to the consumers who are potentially looking for something like that. Um, and so you really want to stand out in ways, and there are several ways to do that, whether it's through your tone and personality, your logo, your, the types of products that you make. Um, it, and it really is up to sort of your resources, your, your capacity, and also who you are personality-wise as a brand. Branding is also key because it drives loyalty, and loyalty among core consumers, super fans um, in, in trade and in sort of the world at large, um, as well as influencers. And loyalty is a big deal. Now, even if you get like your, your big MBA degree or if you work at a CPG firm, you know, they use a lot of sort of like trade words and, 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 and sort of industry terms. Um, and it, it can kind of get, you know, a little crazy with all of the terms, but one that never goes away, whether you're just kind of a small business owner, just talking about, okay, what can I do to kind of, to be a little bit more successful and get my product out there? or um, as someone in a big marketing firm at like Procter & Gamble or a Campbell Soup Company, is this idea of loyalty. Um, people try it once, that's great, but once they try it, you know, are they gonna love it and they're gonna wanna try it again and then again, and then they love this what, idea of what you stand for or they love the quirkiness of your label or they love how approachable you are or X, Y, and Z reason. If you can cultivate that among your sort of rock star consumers, say you start out at the farmer's market, those would be your core consumers. Um, you can find out like, why is it that you love us so much? You know, is it really me as a founder and my personality and what I'm trying to do? Or is it something about the, the cheese that I make? Um, or in this case, this photo here is of two, are of two um, amazing, amazing tradesmen um, in our industry. Uh, the, the gentleman on the left is Valdemar Albrecht. He is sort of like a, what, what would I say now? He's worked at several or sort of specialty cheese locations and he is very well connected. He's like the, the glitterati um, of the cheese world. He's a wonderful character in of himself. And if he is a fan of your brand, he will be your walking billboard. Because as you know, running a business is very, very intensive. It's seven days a week. There aren't enough hours in a day that, you know, to do the promotion on top of that. So when you have these loyal people who can talk positively about you, who can ask for your product at the market or from a farmer's market coordinator or from a website um, or mention it to their friends on social media or in casual conversations, they become your advocates and you can amplify your presence and your marketing just by having people be your BFFs in terms of, I love what you do. So you see Valdi here, his handkerchief is actually from La Quercia, uh, the prosciutto producer in uh, Norwalk, Iowa, uh, really the first to bring artisan prosciutto to America. Um, on the cap that he's wearing is Save the Emmentaler, which was a really lovely and cheeky campaign from uh, Gormino Cheese Importers that specializes in these alpine cheeses that are very, very small production, very, very low volumes. But... Um, high demand uh, among the specialty cheese channels, um, not only for their scarcity, but because of you know, the, the, the affinage process and also where the cows grade and the type of milk um, of this. And particularly with Emmentaler, that's kind of, you know, kind of maligned um, in the past couple of years. And then obviously he's wearing a Neil's Yard dairy shirt. Um, so a lot of cheese love, Justin Baldy on the left. On the right is um, Marnie Clark, from uh, two prestigious sort of cheese shops in this in the downtown Los Angeles area. And she and her sister are huge advocates of artisan cheese in the land of like Glitz and Paparazzi. And uh, though their footprints, their retail shops are actually quite small, their food service and their catering are huge. And not only do they do it for academics at Pomona College and UCLA, but they're also doing Oscar parties for producers and celebrities. And so when you have people out there singing your praises, other your chances are more and more people and others are gonna be hearing of you. And the most compelling reason is probably number three is that food is emotional. We got into it for a reason. I get 
so amped up about talking um, of my favorite food producers or my favorite food companies as much as say my friends would about, you know, their favorite like fish concert or, you know, their favorite sort of band and food, you know, chefs are rock stars. And now more artisan, you know, producers are being looked at as sort of like, you know, these heroes in our society because, you know, they're maybe they're not working the nine to five and maybe they didn't go on this conventional career track. And, you know, they're, they're trying to create something special and become food heroes. Um, and what you find is that it's very emotional for people to, if that they don't pursue it themselves, they really root for the people who do. Um, if not necessarily with their dollars, then with their man hours in terms of the hours that they spend awake scrolling through Facebook and scrolling through Instagram. On the left, you have a screenshot of a West Coast uh, Instagram influencer, Shut the Kale Up, um, which is such a silly name, but she has uh, about half a million followers on Instagram. And she espouses sort of this real food, healthy-ish lifestyle um, in a very genuine way, um, in a very sincere way that kind of organically gave her a lot of followers. She's not a company that spent $5,000 on a campaign to say, buy me X amount of followers so that I look really special you know, on paper. This organically grew out of sort of her health journey her you know journey into motherhood and how her food choices determine how you know she raises her family um and how she budgets and how she shops and how she cooks and how she deals with her anxiety or postpartum depression and she has a huge following and a lot of brands want to work with her because of her values and likewise she only works with brands that really um resonate with sort of who she is and how she you know, makes the food purchasing decisions for her family. In the middle is an example of a great um, company run or producer run social media channel on Instagram. Um, this is Bell Campo Meat Company uh, based in the Bay Area. And this really shows sort of the, the soup to nuts of who they are from farm, from ranch to table. Um, and they thrive on sustainability, sort of pasture raised, grass centric. Um, um, meats, fresh cuts and fresh meats and a little bit of a curing program. And they also have, um, I think, a handful of food service, so a, a handful of restaurants. And not only that, they have a retail store. So, you know, they, they support a lot of local brands, you know, wherever they have a cafe or a restaurant. And so you see that, you know, they're not afraid to show primal cuts. They're not afraid to show sort of the, the animals and their element and that the animals aren't the shiny white, you know, perfect babe pigs. In fact, you know, they're, they're very unique looking heritage brands or that, you know, the, the CEO in the upper right corner there is, you know, very hands-on and, you know, rolls up her sleeves, you know, to, because her background is in ranching um, and nonprofits um, to really make the company thrive, but also make products that are good and that people want to buy. And then on the very far right, you have another type of influencer um, and actually probably the best one a brand could ever get. Um, there is an R&B singer, pop singer by the name of John Legend. And his wife is a former Sports Illustrated supermodel um, and a celebrity in her own right. She is hilarious on social media. She also happens to be a huge food lover and an avid home cook. Um, they love to go out to eat. They love to experience new things. She is a self-professed lover of cheese. And one year for her birthday, actually recently, John Legend bought Chrissy Teigen a whole wheel of Parmigiano Reggiano. And she subsequently started um, Instagramming and live tweeting sort of you know, making pasta dishes like the cacio pepe, you know, with the Parmigiano version or different carbonaras. And so you see here, you can slightly read on the caption, you know, if you haven't seen one of these wheels, oh man, it is a thing of beauty. And the very last thing here, it makes me emotional. Um, and cheese for a lot of people makes them emotional in such a good way. And so you find that across the board, whether it's an organic following developed by um, an Instagram influencer, a company themselves to, you know, sort of these food celebrities, food is emotional. It, it, people get it. They will immediately sort of connect with you um, and, and what you have to offer. So as a producer and with all those things to consider with branding, you have a few challenges in the landscape. Um, there's market volatility, volatility, you know, in terms of dairy prices. Do you have to buy milk from somebody else or are you the one selling milk um, in addition to kind of help with your cheese making operation or your dairy operation? Um, in America, we've had quite a bit of market volatility uh, and I think that seems to be the trend across a lot of um, the Western world. Um, 
plant-based options are kind of a huge needle mover uh, for retailers and obviously for people in the dairy industry. Um, it's not that suddenly everybody is becoming vegan. Um, I think people still eat cheese to a small degree, but you know, instead of drinking milk or pouring milk on their cereal, they may be more prone to pouring almond milk. Um, and the primary reason for that seems to be that people view plant-based options as quote unquote more healthy. And so, you know, dairy may have a reputation for being, you know, full of antibiotics or, you know, feedlot farming, or, you know, maybe there's the trust that's no longer there because maybe it was never communicated, even though all along you did have, you know, legitimate grass-fed milk, but no one ever knew it. But so suddenly everyone migrated to this idea of like, oh, dairy, is bad, you know, maybe almond milk is better, but now we're finding almond milk is so processed and it takes, it's a resource intensive and especially in drought ridden California, why would you devote all that water to almond production and then the bee situation? So we're finding that plant-based isn't perfect, but it still seems to be a better choice for a lot of the consumers and they're taking more and more of the market share and more and more away from dairy. And again, that's where consumer perceptions come in in terms of how are the animals being taken care of is this product healthy for me? And is it sustainable not only for my health, but also for the community at large? Um, and so those are some of the challenges, whether you're big and small in dairy, especially that, that um, you'll be coming across, whether you're in a smaller sort of retail area or you know, if you're trying to expand and get broader distribution. But you have an advantage versus say a larger manufacturer um, in your scale and being the size that you are um, and making the products that you make. And number one is your narrative. Um, your unique story is what's going to help drive the brand and actually connect with people. Uh, and a lot of that is number two, that your value is driven. Um, people want to hear that you care or that you're making changes. And, you know, that's where the distinction comes in. Maybe you stand out because you are the only sustainably raised milk, you know, um, available, you know, in the section. You, you need to promote that a little bit more and amplify that to that audience to show that we're different than what you think this whole section is or what the cheese case is. Like we are not that. In fact, we are quite special and here's why. And a lot of that can be communicated through the third point, which is transparency. Farming and production practices, showing people that you have a special breed of cow or, you know, your ladies have personalities and that you take care of them or that, you know, you have a biodynamic operation or just something distinctive to show that like, hey, we know what we're doing. We're trying to make this, you know, our community a better place. We are trying to make the land a better place. We're trying to make our animals as comfortable as possible. They want that sort of transparency. And also in production, um, a lot of these artisan cheeses are what's called clean label. And that's what consumers are automatically looking for, but they don't necessarily make that association with cheese production. Um, and Another advantage that you have is consumer and customer relationships in terms of having less layers to work through, work through in an organization or a company. You can talk directly to the people saying, I am the founder, I am the cheesemaker, and I am proud that we do these things, or this is a way that we opted to do these things because you know, we're finding that no one else does in this way. Um, and all of that contributes to a higher degree of authenticity. And authenticity is what people crave. People are very, very suspicious of companies and brands. They really, really love companies and producers that have a face or a story or some values associated with it. And so this is just sort of a really quick look at sort of macro trends that kind of support this and that these big companies are trying to respond to, but they simply can't because they're too bulky. They're not agile enough. Like you can't greenwash, you know, a package of salami with, you know, fake craft paper and fake printed, you know, cursive handwriting to say that, you know, it's artisan and it's delicious, even though it's pumped full of nitrates and other fillers. Um, and so there are ways to, to pay, pay attention to this and use it as your advantage as a smaller artisan producer. And number one is a strong brand purpose. So 73% of consumers surveyed feel they uh, say they feel positively about brands that share the why behind the buy. Again, your mission. <clears throat> why are you doing what you do? Clean labels. 87% of consumers said they looked at nutrition labels and 67% of those said they prefer fewer and simpler ingredients. And for artisan and specialty cheese producers, that's kind of a given. Uh, if you've ever compared it to say, you know, a part skim um, a mozzarella producer that has like ascorbic acid and, and other preservatives in it um, and other um, shelf stabilizers in it versus say someone who makes fresh mozz um, or, or, or burrata, you know, with the cream, with a creamy belly that has a maximum of like three ingredients and that includes um, the, the rent. 
So 68% say they're willing to pay more for these that if they don't contain these ingredients that they perceive are bad. So not only would they pay more for taste and flavor, that's already a given. All the market trends um, prove that, and we know that just from experience, but they're willing to pay more that if it's viewed as having being more transparent or having more clean label. So you guys are all premium. We, everybody in specialty and natural food are considered a, a premium. We're not necessarily lumped into sort of the commodity bucket yet. And so we have to understand that premium continues to evolve in meaning for the people that we sell to. And that it starts with finding the most premium and simple ingredients optimized for taste. And you're already winning at that because you have better care and handling, you have the know-how and the experience to create something unique for that cheese case um, or for the menu. Um, but the idea of it as a great product along with full transparency about how it's made, why it's made and the values, that's what resonates. And so you already have that endemic to who you are as an operation. You just need to codify that or give it some organization and structure so you can use it to your advantage. So here um, is basically how you can start building yours. Um, not a 10 step program, but it happened to be 10 bullet points. But it starts with seeing what you already have, right? You may already have some great packaging or you, know, you got a great logo or you already have great placement and distribution. You, you know, you're kind of at capacity, but could you do social better? Or could you work on you know, doing any sort of promotions better if you are in a traditional you know, store environment? Um, but number two is probably the most important thing if you haven't done it already. You need to write down or refine your narrative, who you are, what you make, and why you do it, and turn that into your mission statement into number three, all right? And anything beyond that is really um, can be adjusted. Uh, so don't feel like you're locked into anything. You can try it out. And because you know our market share is relatively small, that if you decide to change or edit something, you, you're not impacting millions and millions of people. You're just kind of refining the message for a few thousand or a few hundred thousand folks, depending on how big you are right now. And so assess. And then it's also important to pay attention to what other people are doing. If you aren't already, um, you can do what's called a SWOT analysis. And SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and that's just a basic assessment that, you know, any sales manager would do in terms of like, how you compare to other people. What traits do you have similar to other people, unique versus other people? Um, and that's number six that you do there. That helps you with number seven, which is your positioning statement. And that's the refined, uh, the refined um, mission statement, who, what, why. Um, what is it specifically that you offer your people? A lot of people make cheese. You can say, oh, we make great tasting cheese. That's great. So do two dozen other people um, at the farmer's market or in the cheese counter. What is it so great about your cheese? What is it that's so great about you, um, your why, like you, your, your, your mission to do this? Why is it that you want to make the cheese and what is it that, that, that's unique about it? That's your positioning statement. Where do you want to be? And then I identify all those things that make it uniquely you. Maybe it's the, the brand, the logo that you already have. Maybe you want to set aside some colors or a style of printing or, you know, your personality or your voice. And that's where you bring in the sort of those typically quote unquote marketing associated people like a graphic designer, or maybe you do hire a salesperson that has some marketing experience or just an outright marketing professional and make sure that you're putting those assets front and center. That's going to help you create the consistency and that's the consistency sort of set up in number nine that foundation needs to go before you try to grow big or scale up you need to make sure that you have these foundations in place and set and then number 10 is another reassessment like is everything kind of falling into line um, are you getting feedback from customers are people loving it do they not get it are they not even noticed some of the changes or the consistency that you got? And you can do that easily through social media um, in terms of a post, asking a question, asking for people's feedback. Um, generally, the engagement tends to be higher um, when you actually provide an ask or a question uh, for a call to action. Leave a comment. What's your favorite flavor? We're thinking about making two different types of cheeses. Which one would you prefer? Or, you know, if you already have an email list, that is the most valuable thing you have. In fact, it's more valuable than say Instagram followers or Facebook followers, because those are your direct assets. You can hook them up to a Google survey or a survey monkey survey, or just send them an email saying, Hey, I've got these ideas. What do you think of X, Y, and Z? Send me what, you know, send me your thoughts, just hit reply here, you know, and to incentivize it, you can give them a sample of your new cheese or the prototype or just as a thank you and you refine as needed. So these 10 steps can be done cyclically over the lifespan of, um, 
your uh, your career as a cheese producer or as a food artisan? Labeling and having that local element too. People like to to know also that it's local. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and and especially with premium consumers and um, artisan food consumers, locality has um, a huge boon. Well, and that's helpful when you are definitely at the small business stage um, or you're concentrating your marketing efforts on a specific area. Um, and so there are definitely advantages to that. And if it you know, falls in line with you know, your voice and, and sort of you know, other products that you make and how you go about them, then that is one of the easiest ways, I think, that, that cheese artisans can create some distinction. So instead of just a cheddar, you know, is it a, is it a um, for instance, what's, what's a really good one? Beehive cheese um, in, in Utah makes a barely buzzed cheddar. Now we've had flavored cheeses forever stateside, um, but they, not only did they have a unique recipe in that it was coffee um, and chocolate and cocoa beans and lavender um, used to, as a rub on this cheese, um, but they, kind of gave a nod to the quirky Mormon culture that kind of, you know, vetoes any caffeine and alcohol. Uh, and, and here they have coffee kind of, you know, encapsulating this cheese through the whole aging process. And they call it barely buzzed because it's still legal, you know, and it resonated with the Utah consumers and it resonated with people outside of Utah. And so the cheese has tremendous success, um, not just where the human comes from, but also nationwide because people have a certain level of familiarity and it's also a delicious cheese. So winning all around. Yeah, absolutely. So Allison's asking, so how should um, the small artisan producer sector respond to the large scale corporate producers trading to cloak themselves and make themselves look more like a small craft brand when they're not. And so Allison actually brings up a really good point um, that a lot of people, not just cheese producers, um, have been struggling against um, with the popularity. Um, all the data shows these big companies um, that there's money to be made where we are. Um, and they're essentially, th there is some greenwashing um, to it. Uh, and, and certainly in my last uh, career um, in charcuterie, we saw that quite a bit from people um, who didn't take care of their pigs and whatnot. And, and that was the exact question we were kind of sitting with for a good year or two before, you know, we decided. And so th there are a couple of ways. Number one is kind of the regulatory route in that a lot of um, federal agencies will actually have definitions for certain terms. So in America, you know, for instance, um, all natural was kind of like a big buzzword um, when it came to meats, fresh meats or cured meats. And then suddenly, you know, because everybody then migrated to all natural, organic became more um, of a boon um, um, for people trying to gain distinction. And then quickly, you know, the bigger companies followed suit. So I hate to say it, it's almost kind of like a chasing game, but those regulatory sort of definitions um, kind of help you give an advantage because you're already that versus the bigger companies trying to change a whole supply chain system to meet that.